Okay, so we are recording, apparently. Um, okay, so thank you for coming. I want to keep this really informal. I don't want to have it really formal. I have, it's nice to see faces that I haven't yet met as well. Hello, Bernadette, and hello, Sandra. Um, but I want to keep this really informal, so please feel free to back and forth and ask questions as I go through this. But what I really want to talk about in terms of speaking is, first of all, I thought I'd give you a little bit about my own journey and how I got into speaking. And the first thing I want to say is that, obviously, I was not born a speaker. Um, and I just wanted to share a photo of me. This was me on my third birthday with my pet guinea pig, Poodle. So I wasn't born a natural speaker. Um, although that photograph would probably say to the contrary, I was a very chatty child. So I have always had a bit of a gift of the gab, as we would say in the UK. I've always had a little bit of a social element to me and I've always had a bit of a need to be heard. So whilst I wasn't born a natural speaker, I was definitely born a natural attention speaker. Um, and this is me eating snow in the north of England at about the age of four. I look older there, don't I? Um, I started out my life, my professional adult life as an actor. So my background is that I worked as a jobbing actor for about 10 years. I also directed theatre, which I still do. And alongside all of that work, I write and I work with organisations around speaking, personal impact, communications and assertiveness. All of those things really, my, my previous work as an actor has inspired. Because obviously when you have to get up and you stand on a stage, not only are you dealing with all of the nerves, all of the things that are going on in our heads around that, which I'll talk about a bit later, but you're also looking at the dynamics of communication, the dynamics of human relationships and all of that stuff. And these are things that are really important to becoming a speaker, doing it well. So I'd say that there are two sides to, to all of it really. Firstly, it's the, the skills around it. Can you get up there? Are you able to hold a room, et cetera? And I'll give you some sort of touchstones on that one. Some of them you may know already. Uh, please feel free to add in if there's anything else that you would like to share. I don't want to hog the floor on this entirely but the other side of that is what do you want to talk about and why do you want to talk about it so having that clarity of purpose sort of that magic why if you like is really important we know this cognitively but often we don't practice it and it's so important because if you get on the floor and you don't know why you're talking about it and you don't know what it is that you want to galvanize people into thinking or doing then it will fall flat on its face that's a given. And I think the other thing to say about speaking is, as much as I joke about myself as a child being a chatterbox and an attention seeker, <laughs> um, you do have to want to do it for the right reasons. And I would say the right reasons to speak, to get up there and speak is to get people to think differently, to get people to consider different opportunities, different possibilities, and to bring people together. I was talking to Kate earlier today, um, and I want to share a little anecdote. So when I was about 20, 21, my friend's grandmother said to us, now girls, listen. And this was about men and relationships and men. And she said, now girls, listen. She said, men are like bars of soap. And we were kind of like, what, what on earth do you mean men are like bars of soap? And she said, well, men are like bars of soap because if you try and squeeze hold of a bar of soap, it will slip out of your hand. And then you try and pick it up in the shower and you'll end up a state and you'll end up not being able to get hold of the soap and then you look up and you'll just look disheveled and you still won't have the soap. And I thought that's quite a clever metaphor actually for sort of chasing after men and wanting to keep hold of men. And she said, no, what you need to do with men and bars of soap is you need to hold them like that. And then they will stay. <laughs> um, I share that story because what has become really clear to me is that we also have to do that with audiences. If we try and grab hold of an audience and make them listen to what we want to say and try to get them on side, then they probably will do the very opposite. So what we really have to do is just turn up and hold our message, hold whatever it is that the purpose of what we want to be there for, the galvanization that we would like to inspire, and then we just have to let people come. But equally, we have to be prepared for them to not come. 
And I think that's one of the golden nuggets of speaking. We can't just stand up there and expect everyone to be on side. They won't be. So you have to be confident enough in your message to be okay with that. Um, that is the key thing, really, that I wanted to say about, about that is, you know, having the confidence in oneself to not always win the room, but be anchored by one's own purpose and internal congruency of that purpose. So as I say that, it, it, it's, um, that might be quite a big think piece in itself, but just have people go away and kind of think, well, what do I want to talk about? What, why? Is it strong enough? And to be really honest with yourselves about, is it strong enough? Is it, does it hold its own weight up there? Do I care about this enough? And I've probably learned this at times the hard way. It's not enough to think, oh, this is a really good bit of money to get. Because I've definitely done speaking gigs like that where I've turned up and I've gone, I can talk about that. It's a great amount of money. Could really use that right now. And then I've turned up and I've spoken, but because my heart hasn't been as in it as possible, or I've, there's been a little tiny part of my brain just kind of going, when, when is it over and when can I get a glass of wine? Then that means that the whole thing will fall on its face. So it's really important that it's purposeful. So this is me doing my thing. This was 2015. Um, this was my TED talk. This was the first TED talk I did. There's a second one looming in September, hopefully. I mean, I don't know if that's going to materialize given the current climate, but, but we'll see about that. Um, this TED Talk taught me an awful lot about speaking under pressure. So what I would say about speaking under pressure is you need to know your topic and what you're going to say inside out. You need to be able to cover areas that you didn't think were going to come up. Because when we're under pressure, pretty much anything can happen. The pressure of that room for me was, it was a room of about 360 people, something like that, which is a pretty big room. Um, that in itself was, you know, a little bit nerve inducing, but it wasn't too bad. But the things that were really nerve inducing were these huge cameras positioned around the room on these enormous tripods and all sorts of sound systems wired up and microphones wired up. And whilst I was used to having that sort of thing when I used to be a theater actress, the difference with this one was the thing of, it's gonna end up online. And I have no editing influence at all. <laughs> about what they ultimately put up there. So whatever I give them is gonna go online. And that is quite terrifying, actually. Also having three red letters, T-E-D, next to you, terrifying. Terrifying to me. So what that taught me was that it's really important to be able to talk about your subject. You know, you need to be able to stand up there and talk about it for half an hour in the most high pressured situation, not that a TED talk or any talk is usually that length, but there are things that can happen like you might lose your thread or you might dry or you might suddenly think, actually, I want to talk about this now because you're responding to the people in the room. You're responding to those nods. You're thinking, oh, this is landing. So I'm going to go down this road rather than another road. So whilst you might rehearse and have a, a structure of what you want to talk about, it's important to have a little bit extra content for those times where the unexpected might, might come upon you. And of course, you might always get those unexpected questions. Um, so long as you know your subject, you'll be able to manage that. If you don't, then I just wouldn't recommend it unless you absolutely have to do it. Notice the difference between that picture and that picture. That's me under pressure. That's me relieved. Under pressure, relieved. <laughs> okay. And um, this talk went fairly well. I would definitely do things differently if I could go back and do it again. But someone once uh, said to me that a presentation was a series of mistakes really well recovered from. And I like that because it really takes the pressure off. If we can know that it's never going to go as we plan it to go ever. <laughs> and we let ourselves off the hook of having to be perfect or having to be amazing. And instead we put our attention on, this just has to reach people and it doesn't matter if it's imperfect and it doesn't matter if something throws me off because I know that I've got enough stuff 
in my remit to pull me back on track, then you're going to be good. You're going to be good. Um, I talked about clarity of message before. I'd like to ask you, how do you know if something has clarity? It's authentic and truthful. Hi, Kate. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's authentic and truthful. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Maybe if you're talking to somebody, you don't have that glazing over their eyes when you explain. And that way, you know, okay, it's landing. Right. Yeah. So you can tell by reading the room or reading the people on the other side, whether or not that message is clear. Absolutely. Anything else that you would say you, makes you know that your message is clear? I think it should be simple and crisp, really, in terms of the quantity of content you provide. Yeah. Keep your sentences short. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Sandra. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is. It's about being short to the point. Less is always more. And when we talk about personal story, which is always a, a good idea in a presentation, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on context, and obviously you would make that judgment call, um, really we want to leave out detail rather than put too much in. Mm -hmm. We want to give the bare minimum. The less we give, the more empathy we will get. The less we give, the more space we allow for people to come in and join us. If we don't, if we give too much information, it becomes too much like, oh, that's somebody else's story. I can't quite relate. Around clarity, of course, is give the pauses. And I want to spend a bit of time in pause, Bill, <laughs> as I like to call it, because this is probably the most effective multifunctional tool that you can master within a presentation or a piece of public speaking. And a pause will do all of the following. So I'm just going to list them out one at a time and I'll leave a nice pause in between each one because I need to be practicing what I preach. So the first reason for the pause is people need to absorb what you're telling them. People need to absorb what you're telling them. If you don't give them time to absorb, then you might as well not bother getting up there in the first place. So there's a really nice little analogy, which is imagine feeding a child, you know, spoonfuls of, I don't know, something tomato -y and messy, right? So you're giving them lots of spoonfuls of that. If you don't allow that child to take in that food, chew it around, swallow it, then assimilate it within their own neocortex, within their own organization of brain, then there's no point. So it's like how we take in, chew, digest food. Information is just the same. It's food for the brain. But we need to let the brain chew it around and assimilate it. The pause allows that to happen. The other thing with a pause is it's a two-way thing. So it also allows us the time and the opportunity to connect with our own thinking. If we go too fast, if we try to overstuff with too much information, if we're reading the room and we suddenly think, oh my God, that person's not listening, that person doesn't like what I'm saying. Oh, I feel like this is going horribly wrong. I just want to get it done and over with. Um, we, we tend to rush and it has the opposite effect. A pause will help reunite your thinking and your speaking. Sometimes you have to hold your nerve. Sometimes you have to pause for what is less comfortable for you in order that the audience get what they need or in order that you get what you need in terms of bringing yourself back on track. Pause is also really good as an emphasis. So you can be really obvious with that emphasis. There's something that you really want them to take on board or you can be quite subtle with it. And that's when it gets really good in terms of influencing a room. So you can subtly influence by strategically placing a small subtle pause either before or after the phrase or the word that you want to land on them.
equally, deliberately leaving big epic pauses here to <laughs> emphasize my point, equally, a pause can really put accountability onto an audience. Now, this can be really useful when we want to inspire change. We want to move people out of inaction and into action, right? That's when it's change to happen. We're ripe that because of the climate right now, I would say that this is probably the most fertile ground, or at least it will be in a few months' time, in terms of influence and new ways of thinking. So the pause used in that way can really help people pick up their accountability and their responsibility. It stops people hiding. To use an example that for that and he wasn't pausing you know last year we lost two billion and and of course we need to do better next year so what i'm proposing is that doesn't land that's like oh yeah it's just two billion it's two billion last year we lost two billion pounds next year we've got to do better Right. You just put a pause in there and it really, it, people go, <gasps> right. You can't hide from it, but that's what you need. So we don't want to frighten people unnecessarily or make people feel accountable if it's not contextually appropriate. But if it is, then if the purpose for you getting on that stage is to create change and create action around change, you've got to use those pauses. Think of it as like the vocal white space that you would have on a page. That's another way of thinking about a pause. And of course, the other thing that a pause will do is it will give you status. It will give you gravitas. Taking space vocally is the same as taking space physically. If we shrink our content, like we sometimes shrink our physical being, then we are going to diminish our impact. I'm not talking about going absolutely ridiculously over the top and pausing for, you know, hours and hours and hours because obviously then that's just inauthentic and awkward but you do need to gauge it and you definitely need to hold your own status or the status of the information by using your pauses and lastly you can really sort of steer a room with a pause so you can either close down a room that's distracted and chatty and going off on different tangents by just pausing and holding your composed nerve Pause with intention is key. You can't pause and then fall out of it. You have to have that like intention. But then you can also open up a room, a question, a rhetorical question, an open question, whatever, followed by a pause and a little step back communicates, you know, non-verbally to the audience. Oh, right. They want us to come in now. So if you want to create a more of a two way or you want to really get people thinking about some rhetoric, that's the dynamic that you would use. Um, has anyone got any further thoughts or had any aha moments around the pause? All make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go back to this one. Now, this is, um, this is, represents 100% of the communication that we have when we're up there, the, the, the communication power that we have when we're up there. Now you've probably seen something like this before, so I'm just going to use this as an anchor point to bounce things off of. We've talked about the power of the pause. We've talked about clarity of message. Other things to consider are speed, volume, musicality and inflection of voice. All of the stuff that we're doing vocally is represented by the red segment in this pie chart. So what we do vocally and this isn't what we say, this is how we say it only. What we do vocally has about a 30% impact-ish. We're not being specific on the percentages, but it's about a third. So quite often what can happen when we're presenting or speaking is we spend loads and loads and loads of time thinking about the content, whether that's visual content, spoken content. Yes, we need to think about our content. Our content has to be really sharp. We need to know what it is. We need to know why we're saying it and all of that. But actually the content is represented by the green, which is about 10% thereabouts. 
if we just focus on the content and we don't focus on, well, how am I going to say that? Where am I going to pause? What do I want the audience to get there? And all of the other stuff that I'm going to talk about in a minute, then we will not have the most important impact when speaking and therefore we won't have the confidence when we speak both internally and externally so when you find yourself getting pulled into just thinking about content all the time then remember this little pie chart remember that it's about 10 percent, and whilst it's 10 percent, without it we don't have a presentation without the other stuff it will not reach its maximum impact The blue is the body language and everything else we do around body language. And I've probably the most important thing to say around the blue part, you know, which is the, what we do is we are egocentric creatures. We are human beings with a big neocortex that does way too much overthinking and is way too self-conscious most of the time. Now, if we don't be careful around that, then that can negatively impact all of the stuff in the blue. So this is a two-way conversation, really. When we're thinking about things that we are doing, we also need to think about the impact that an audience member doing it has on us. So when we look at body language, we first of all think about eye contact. Now, we need to obviously spread our eye contact. You don't want to be doing it in a really methodical way because it looks odd. <laughs> but also what we do want to be careful of are a few things. If we feel like our eye contact is in one place for too long, move it, spread the joy, spread the joy of your gaze, move it, okay? Secondly, be careful of people sitting on your um, extremes because they are in your blind spot. So think of it like driving. Every so often, check your blind spots, as in check the extreme ends of the rows or the extreme ends of the room, whatever environment you're presenting in. And then the other thing to say about eye contact is if you've got a particularly big room, it's impossible to look at everybody. So you need to just think about chunking the space down into areas. If you look into the center of an area, it will almost spill into the people surrounding that area. So then you can move it around and think, okay, I've done that section, I've done that section, done that section. You can move it around randomly, but just make sure that you manage all of the sections as well as your blind spot sections at the side. So that present as eye contact. But the problem is we get hijacked by the eye contact and the expressions that are hap happening sorry, in the audience as well. So if someone is giving us the eye contact with a frown, for example, we can really easily get our own eye contact hijacked onto them because we're too busy trying to convince them that we're good and what we're talking about is important and we want them on side. And if we do that, and it's really easy to get pulled into that, I still get pulled into that sometimes and I have to like recognize it and pull myself out of it. Um, what we risk is losing the rest of the room. We risk cutting off the potential influencers that we have in the room, the champions, the investors, whoever it is, you know, the people who've got the action in their, in, and the fuel in their bellies to do something to support our inspirational change. We can sometimes miss them out because we're too busy trying to convince the naysayer in the room or the perceived naysayer because sometimes people frown of course when they're really paying attention or when they're processing or maybe they've got a headache and probably 95 percent whatever they're doing with their face is nothing to do with us and it's everything to do with them but because we are egocentric creatures, we make it about us and then it gets in our headspace and it gets in our thinking and then we end up undermining our own presentation, which is when it can be disastrous. Be careful of that. Also be careful of the big sort of nodder, the big the person can like, oh, I love you. I love everything you're saying. I am your biggest champion because they may not be. <laughs> they may just be nodding, but not really listening. And again, you can risk ostracizing other people in the room. So remember to spread your eye contact and remember that whatever other people are doing behaviorally may mean what you think it means, but the likelihood is it will mean something else that has nothing to do with you. When we are adrenalized, we become very oversensitive about what other people's reactions are. So just be careful of that. The other thing to talk about is space and our use of space, which also sits in the blue. So how we utilize space when we're presenting is everything. 
If you are someone who is naturally still, do not attempt to pace around the stage area or the presentation area, because if you're not comfortable, guess what? Your audience won't be comfortable either, all right? If you're someone who is quite still, just make sure you move a little bit every now and then. It might be just a tiny little few steps to the right or the left or forward, but um, don't put pressure on yourself to have to cover lots and lots of space. You can cover it in other ways. You can cover it with your eyes. You can cover it vocally. By contrast, if you're someone who is very much a mover, then by all means move. But if you're moving too much, do give yourself the opportunity to stop. So in other words, whatever you do, naturally do it. But if you, re if you think you're overdoing it, you probably are, do something else. That's the only guideline I would give you around presentations. We're all different creatures. Some of us are more introverts, some of us are more extroverts, some of us are louder, some of us are quieter. Doesn't matter. So long as you're clear, you've got your purpose, you know your content, you're using your pauses, you're not being thrown by your eye contact, you're reaching everybody, and you are mixing up how you use space in a way that is authentic for you. Any thoughts on space? or indeed eye contact, which you did before. I don't know if you're open for the questions, Danny, um, but one of the questions I have is, these are all uh, really great tips. Is there a way to practice them uh, not in a real life situation, so to say, you know? So how yeah. do you prepare yourself for speaking? Yeah, and yeah. And taking it all into account? Yeah, no, good question. Thank you for that. It's um, everything I'm giving you, is so i would say presentation or public speaking is an amplified conversation right it might be more one way as in you're doing most of the speaking but actually it is two way because you're engaging other people so the reason that i say that is even if you're not stood on a stage or sat in a meeting room or whatever your presentation context is you can practice this stuff in any conversation that you have with any other human being so you can practice pauses. If you're talking to more than one person, you can practice spreading your eye contact. Because even if we're talking to two people, we tend to look more at one person than the other for, for whatever reason. If you, if you recognize you're doing that, just consciously move it to the other person as well. You can play around with all of this stuff. This is all the stuff of personal impact as well as presentation. If you notice that they're your habits, you know, in terms of not moving much, moving a lot. And obviously it's contextual, right? If you sit, you know, if you're out for dinner or out for a drink, you know, remember the days <laughs> before we were all confined. Um, you know, if you feel like you're someone who doesn't really engage and sort of sits back and takes a little bit of space, then play around with taking more. So that obviously it's on a smaller level, but the more you do that, the more equipped you will be when the stakes are high. So that's a really great, a great question, Julia, thank you. All of this stuff is applicable to any other situation. So to go back to more of the body language stuff, other things that play in here are how we hold our posture. We want to be open, of course, but if you, if you fold your arms, don't panic. Sometimes it's just comfy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're being closed. Body language doesn't have rules. It has guidelines. There was a period in time where we were given a lot of rules about body language. Um, be careful of that because this would mean I was lying according to those rules. But you know what? Sometimes I've just got an itchy nose, for example, right? So don't worry too much about that. It's all about intention. If your intention is in the right place, your body language will follow. If you are feeling trepidatious or nervous or any of those things, then yes, be aware of what your body is giving off because thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are linked. They're inextricably linked in a human being. I'm sure you know this. If we are feeling a little bit nervous or a little bit shy, then yes, we might want to move our body language in order to feel better. We might want to take a little bit more space. You might want to walk across the room or reach across the table for a drink of water, which may feel counterintuitive if you're feeling underconfident, but that in itself will actually help to kind of bring that confidence up. So either have your intention on point and don't worry about any of this body language stuff, or if you are feeling any of those back-footed feelings or thoughts, use this stuff to get you back on track. 
I'm also going to say a little bit about clothing. Um, that what I am going to say about clothing is be you, be comfortable, and be appropriate. That's it. I would absolutely rule against turning up suited and booted if you are not someone who is naturally suited and booted because you won't be comfortable and you will be inauthentic. And trust me, I've tried it. It doesn't work for me because I am not that person. I am sat here right now in trainers, leggings, an oversized vintage shirt, and I have, I'm covered in tattoos, right? That's me. I turn up in a way that is me. If it's a smart environment, yes, I'll go smart, but I am not going to wear a suit because I look like a small child and I look like I'm desperate to burst out of it. Be you, be authentic, but be appropriate to your environment. Check ahead if you need to. What's the dress code? Who's going to be there? What, are, what sort of feel do these organizations have? Or if it's in an organization itself, what's the feel of it? And you want to match it in a style that is you. That's it. That's it. Um, what else do I want to say about that? No, I think that's it. I think that's it. In terms of planning ahead, Check out the environment as well, because the, in how the environment is laid out will be, will give you so much information and will be able to inspire or influence your presentation in a certain direction. So don't just turn up to an event or turn up to a presentation room and take what you're given. Occasionally you might have to, but if you can be influential in how that room is laid out, do. So for example, if you have lots of straight lines of chairs, you can talk to those people and they will not interrupt you. If that's what you want, that's great. But if you want to create a two-way dynamic, then you do not want to have your chairs in rows. You want to soften the rows with a little bend at the end or have cabaret tables. Those things will inspire discussion. Ask the head, can I have the room a particular way? Is there a way that at any point between the speakers I can shift the room? I always do that. I am a royal pain in the ass when I go to venues because that's what I always ask. They're like, oh, here she is. She's going to move things. And usually I'm like, yeah, I am. Can you move that table? And they're like, oh, God, here she is. But it's, it's important because actually what that means is that you end up having a more successful presentation. If you really can't influence the room, if it is beyond your control, then you need to design your presentation to work with it. So, for example, you might want to build in, um, turn to the person next to you and have a conversation about type things, which will help to soften the dynamic of the room. Never stand behind a lectern if you can avoid it. This is my biggest bugbear about presenting around the globe. They give you a lectern, they are evil. They are great for putting notes on, that's it. If you stand behind them, we cut off most of our body. The audience can't see them, we're hidden. We cannot trust someone who is hidden from us. It's primal. We cannot trust someone who is hidden from us. And also our torso is our emotional connection point. If people can't see or feel where our, how our torso is communicating, and a lot of it is unconscious communication, then they are not gonna get nearly as much out of the presentation. So if there's a lectern there, shove it to the side, use it to put your water and your notes on by all means, but don't stand behind it. Doesn't matter what anyone else does, just don't stand behind it, come out from there. That would be my other tip. If you are using mics, I tend to not use them unless I absolutely have to, but then I've got quite a loud voice. But if you do use them, get in the room and be able to do a sound check in the room first so that you can gauge the voice levels. And also if you have a lapel mic, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that's going on, going around social media recently, where someone left their mic on to go to the toilet. It is a really common mistake you will undermine any impact you are about to have or have just had if you do that. Much as we are all flesh and blood and we all need to visit the toilet, we don't want to hear each other do it particularly. It's not the most impactful thing. So that might sound like a really obvious thing, but always have on your mind, if you have a lapel mic on, take it off, turn it off before you go to the loo. Even if you're just going to wash your hands, turn it off. Anything else I want to say about this? The yellow piece here, the yellow piece is about, it, this represents what goes on in our heads. So I always think that this should be much bigger 
because if our heads aren't on, on our game, everything else will fall apart. So the yellow piece here represents distraction. We all have them. If we're having them, our audience will be having them. It represents assumptions. We will have them, our audience will have them. That's okay, so long as we don't act on them as if they're true without checking. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but the other thing then, probably the most important thing to talk about for a moment is the fact that we all have inner critics in our head. They are the little demons that tell us we're not being very good, or we didn't just make sense, or we're rambling, or we're not sure if that landed, or should I really have worn this, you know, whatever. Basically, they are the negative childlike voices in our head that will seek to undermine us and trip us up. We all have them. Someone says they haven't got them, they're lying. We've all got them. We can manage them, but something to recognize is that under pressure, those voices in our heads are adrenalized and they, under adrenaline, it's a little bit like you've given them a big bottle of whiskey to play around with. They will get louder, they will get more destructive and they will talk less and less sense to you, but they will knock you off your game if you aren't able to say to them, in your mind's eye, not obviously out loud. You know what, right now I'm busy. It's not the time to talk to you. I'm gonna put my attention on the room. I'm gonna talk about what I need to talk about and later on I'll check in with what you've got to say. Keeping present and connected with the room is the only way that we can limit how much attention we give these voices in our heads. We only have 100% of attention we can give. The majority of that attention has to be on the room. And when wobbles happen, which they will, we will fling our attention back in over. The important thing is to, when that happens is to recognize it and get it back out into the room as quickly as you can. Does that make sense? Danny, one question on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> years ago, dec a decade ago, I was thrown into a situation when I learned, yeah, well, I'll have to have those quarterly events showing up on stage, you know, in front of a group of 300 people. Yeah. And the way I prepared for that challenge, because I was frightened to death. I mean, I really yeah. had not looked for that to come my way. Yeah. But what I did and what I found very, very helpful was to pre prepare myself also with a visualization of how I would be able to protect myself and prepare myself by showing up as a queen, basically, yeah. you know, put into my queen's coat, and I yeah. would have that around me in my, of course, in my imagination. Didn't wear a crown, but of course, I did wear it actually. And yeah. I did have other um, helpful means in my, that is, visualization techniques that helped me to hold the space and. Yeah really get rid of those little adrenaline voices you just mentioned. Do you also use that kind of technique or? Um, you can, do you, you, you can do. I mean, I, I personally don't often use them, but many people do. And like I said before, there's no right or wrong way. It's just what works for you. Right. Um, Amy Cuddy, I, I does a Ted talk on this. If anyone who wants to reference that, and um, it's all about the use of the power pose, right? The use of the power pose, which is kind of what you're talking about, you know, or the visualization is great. Um, the only thing I would say about the being a queen or being a king, and there's nothing wrong with it if you hold that in, in a healthy way, um, <laughs> is, but we don't want to be, um, brings me nicely onto my next point, actually, is that we do not want to come across as that. We yeah. don't want to come across as like, hey, I am your guru, listen to me. And there's an awful lot, of that stuff out there um i'm sure you don't sandra so so my answer is yes absolutely. i was just facilitating at that uh, point you know so it was my yeah. role to be a facilitator and basically yeah. put others in the spotlight so there was no risk for me to Perfect. go over the top <laughs> and no, manipulate that's, the, that's the what i mean things. by a healthy yeah that's what i mean yeah, by yeah. yeah. i see that's your great. point yeah, yeah it's, i think, it's, I think just to add to that conversation um i would also say it also depends on the kind of profile that you are wearing when presenting or being a speaker, because sometimes you become the thought leader. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are the technical facilitator. Sometimes you're trying to instigate 
sort of conversation in the room. So, so it, it also you know, depends on, on what kind of profile, you know, there's a difference between tutoring and lecturing, right? Uh, so, uh, you, you know, when I, when, I, when I say this, when I say this, I'm, I'm using the broad definition that kids are using at the university, mm -hmm. uh, you know, between lecturing and tutoring. You know, I asked my daughter, like, you know, because to, to your point, Danny, and, and the expression, you know, I did not fully understand the difference between the two. But then what I, what, the way it's now being interpreted is lecturing is when they have uh, a, a professor or somebody who's mm -hmm. lecturing 200 or 300 people, mm -hmm. pupils at the same time without much interaction. Sure. Whereas tutoring happens in a much smaller group of, mm -hmm. let's say, it's an intimate setting where there is a lot more interaction happening. So, so, but I guess the point that I was trying to highlight is the two aspects of the two profile are different. When you're pitching to, let's say, uh, 250, 300 people, it's quite different versus when you are pitching to a more intimate where you want interaction to take place rather than just being lectured. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to say before I sort of uh, turn it back to Danny Yu, um, is that you know what I use is I actually have a, let me call it a kind of a pre-meditation or meditation mm -hmm. session before I go into the speech mode because uh, and and typically the last half hour or the last forty-five minutes I do not look at my cell phone yeah. um, and uh, compose myself on how it's uh, you know the visualization not necessarily the king or the queen or the lion. Mm -hmm. but the visualization of what and how am I going to deliver mm -hmm. and completely zone in, you know, I, I think that, that helps, that helps as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's such a good call to not have any distractions there because we, again, it comes back to that first point around clarity, doesn't it? In terms of what, what gets you clear, what do you need to, to get focused or to get your attention on what you're doing? And again, it's different for every single person. So if it, I think the thing that's come out of this is, it's good to build your own routine around this, you know, to work out what do I need in order to be the best up there that I can be. Um, and, and then you give yourself what you need, which, which ties into self-compassion and it ties into not what should I be doing here, but what's going to work for me? What's going to get me grounded? What's going to get me focused? Um, so all, there's, all of those are great things, you know, the queen, the meditation, the no distraction. Um, I definitely don't like talking to people too much a good 15 minutes before. People talk to me 15 minutes before, I'll tend to say to them, love to talk to you. Do you mind if we pick it up off of the net? I just want to think about this for the next 15 minutes. And that people are fine about that, of course, you know. I would like to pick up on an advanced point around uh, the lecturer versus the teacher. And it's, and it's an interesting one. What I would say in response to that is, it's the environment and the context that is different, but you are still you. So sure, we might be bringing a certain element of ourselves to it and, and you know, turning up one particular area of expertise for that room or, or, or whatever, or, or we're talking about this topic, so we're gonna be hearing it there, but it's about being like a human and it's about being a relatable human. And the most important thing and this is from my perspective. I am really, really passionate about this, not just with presenting, but in everything that we do is that we are not superior or inferior to anybody else. We are all humans with our own experience and our own position and our own way of doing things. And so when we stand up there, I feel like that is one of the most important things we can do is be human and be vulnerable and be, hey, hello, fellow humans. This is what I want to bring to you today. Which is why I make the point about staying human rather than guru. It keeps us relatable. There's nothing there less relatable, I think, than a, than a guru standing on the stage. Um, if I may ask a question, Danny, of course. Um, are there um, any specific uh, things during your talk that you do to be more relatable? Um, I, I tend to, I use humor a lot. Um, that's my style. So if you're someone who uses humor, go for it. Obviously keep it appropriate. Um, but I, it's just, 
something that I say when I'm coaching people a lot around this stuff is I said, you know what, just imagine you're having a coffee with this, with these people, talk to them in that way, or imagine you're having a beer or a glass of wine or whatever, you know, whatever liquid or, you know, if you're having a lunch with them or whatever, it's that conversation that you would have socially. You can hold that tone with it. And you can look at people and be like, hey, hello, fellow human, in your mind die. That will put you in a good place. If we start to put pressure on ourselves, like, oh, I have to be really impressive here. I have to be amazing here. You know, and I have to impress them. Then you're going to be in trouble. And I see that happen a lot. I have to be really good. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be, you know, just be you. Just be you and be, you know, use your natural style. It's really worth knowing what your natural style is, though. As in, what are your strengths? And ask people, what are my communication strengths? Where am I good? What do you like about me? We don't ask that a lot and jot it down because they're the things that we want to bring. We don't want to be bringing anything in that we're not already good at. We don't want to be trying to be somebody else. We want to bring what we've got already, which is almost our authentic palette, if you like. And we want to be really playing to those strengths. Like I, I can't be formal if I try. So I just don't bother trying, <laughs> right? That's my style. I'm cheeky, naturally. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit forthright. So I just bring that to the room. And I think that's the thing that makes you relatable. It's, it's what's genuine. What are you genuinely? Yeah, I think, I think just to add to that conversation and uh, you know, if I may reflect and bring in a bit of, of course. Uh, debate in here, um, is that, you know, there's also a natural evolution, you as a speaker, you know, and oh, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, Danny, uh, like you said, uh, you know, um, I didn't have gift of gab, but I had the theatrical when I was growing up as well. So, yeah, I did, uh, you know, participate in, in, in dramatics and plays and, you know, uh, on stage activity and that kind of boosted my confidence mm. in, my, in my growing years and that kind of mm. helped later on. But I've seen people and, and I would like to reflect on what Julia said, bringing in wit, I think makes the conversation more interesting as, and, and, place, and places you as a speaker who is interesting to listen to, you know, so it, it could be uh, through voice modulation, it could be through wit, you know, there are people who, who do not say anything funny, but their voice modulation itself is captivating. Yeah. Uh, compared to some people you use wit, but the challenge with wit is, it comes with practice. It, do not expect that you're going to make it happen, have the room in splits the first time you use wit. And, and I've seen people practice it again and again and again, and then it kind of goes through an evolution where it kind of becomes a second nature Yeah. Uh, yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's absolutely a great point to make. Um, yeah, don't expect it to be amazing straight away, unless, unless you hit a fluke, which is possible. But it, of course, it's, it, I mean, it does evolve. And I think we, we evolve as humans, don't we, as well. Our point of view gets sharper. Our reasons for talking about what we talk about sometimes get more refined or more targeted. And yeah, the practice, the practice gets you better. It's the same with anything. It's back to the Malcolm Gladwell outliers, isn't it? The, the 10,000 hours, right? It's like the more we do something, the more it becomes part of who we are, the more we incorporate it. Um, which ties into Julia's point about trying it wherever you can. And also a great place to actually practice it is these sorts of forums. You know, even on webinars, like it's quite a good way to practice some of these tools. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Julia, other. how about a joke from your side? Pardon? I said, Julia, how about a joke or a witty thing from your side? This is a forum to practice, right? Yeah, it is a form of practice, but I remember that Danny said we're supposed to be genuine and authentic. Jokes are really not my style, but yeah, but I do practice. Um, it does put you sort of on the spot when you are, even in a webinar, even asking a question and your camera is still on and rolling and you know it's going to be recorded. Like Danny said about the TED talk, when you have all these cameras pointing at you, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Yeah, it is. Uh, do you know what I love just happened there? <laughs> <laughs> is Hannah Van said to Julia about a joke and she came straight back with what she is really good at, which is being really quick and succinct and forthright. And I love that you just did that. Yeah. That was, that's absolutely where your strength is, right? And I mean, one of your many strengths. And that's the thing, play to those strengths. That's what makes people so rich, such a rich and delightful mix, really. 
Um, so Danny, if I may ask a question, you know, um, about, you know, coming back from the sort of the TED talk, right? Hmm. Um, you know, when you get on the stage, and this is kind of a, uh, let's call it a strange fright that even the, some of the best speakers and, hmm. and, and you know, stand-up comedians have, right? Hmm. Which is the, the 10 seconds of getting onto the stage and with all the sort of lights flashing on you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then once you start with your flow, it kind of dissolves. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes while you're speaking, all of a sudden your brain will say, oh, by the way, there are these 20 cameras that are looking at you. Yeah. Any tip on how do you handle that? Or your yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I absolutely have the tip and I sort of alluded to it before, but I'll go back and elaborate on that because it's really important. So our, because we're meaning making machines, our brains will go in over. So our attention will go in over. And then the minute we've got that attention in, those little voices will pipe up saying things like, you know, like you've just said, oh, do you, hey, look at all those cameras. Remember, they're all filming you. You've got to be good. Oh my God, you know, or whatever. And that is the real simple thing. I hear you. What's happening in the room? It's like puppy training the brain back out into the room. That you can practice anywhere. You know, we are really good these days at going into this when we're going around our daily business. If you notice you're in your head, get out of your head. I don't mean in any alcoholic or drug fueled way, unless you choose to. But what I mean is put your attention on what's around you. You know, look at that tree. Wow, what a beautiful flower. Oh, that's a good color car. Oh, there's an ugly looking bird. Doesn't matter what it is. When you're going about your daily business, you can do that. And I call that puppy training for the brain. And that is actually getting your attention out from here, back here. It's, um, as well as the stuff that I do, I'm also a specialist in something called the Meisner technique, which is an acting technique. Uh, I coach actors in that. I'm one of the specialists in Europe on that. And that is all about put your attention out here. You have everything you need out here. This will get you stuck in any given moment. We never make sense of things in the moment. We always make sense of them afterwards, right? So we have time to do it afterwards. Remembering that is really important as well. But I know it's a habit and I know it's like a, you know, it's like a primal thing where we feel in danger because everyone's looking at us. Our primal system goes, oh my God, there's a room of hunters looking at me, quick run. And the adrenaline fires off. Sometimes the breathing as well can help with that. Take a moment to just exhale because that carbon dioxide will go up when we're under that pressure. You want to breathe it out. They're my tips. It's really simple. Oh, and one more. Plant your heels harder into the ground. That will actually ground you and get you more in your body than in your head. Just heels down. No one will even know you're doing it. If I, if I may add, it's not so much about the cameras because... Um... I've been on stage, but not so much in front of the cameras. But there is there is a listening technique um, or sort of an interacting technique that I've learned uh, a while ago that might happen might help uh, at a smaller size groups when you have more interaction and you still feel self conscious about what you're doing. Mm. Um, so the technique is um, when you listen to somebody, for example, like we are listening to Danny, try not to have your thoughts at all. So try to to focus so much on what the person is saying, how they're saying it, what's the phrase, what the words, you know, all these kind of details and what's the meaning to to stop any kind of thoughts appearing because it's so easy to to get them going in our heads because, oh, she said butter, I I would like to have bread and butter. And uh, and if you can stop that and say, oh, butter, well, why did she say that? You know, and then, and then your listening skills also improve with that. And maybe that on a smaller scale, when it's a smaller group, but still the camera is around, if you focus on really the content of what people are saying, that, that might help. I don't know. No, it's a great one. That reminds me of something, um, of that really nice phrase, Julia, where someone says, you know, don't, be in, don't think about being interesting, just be interested. Which is, again, a little golden nugget, right? It's like, be interested and turn up your listening. These are all great things that we can do. I'm aware of time and there's one other thing I want to uh, throw in the mix and then I'm going to open it up to anyone who, if there's any other questions or points that anyone wants to make. Um, I want to talk about structure. So whilst our content is only 10% of what we talk about, we still need to have a structure. Now there are several really good structures out there. 
I'm happy to share offline things if people want them. I didn't want to, I have got them in here, but I think I'm going to leave it open because it really is about what fits that individual. And there are so many different structures out there. But what I would say is do not script ever your presentation or your speech. Never script it. Now that might sound like a really odd thing to say, but as an ex-actress and, and as a still a theatre director, um, I can honestly say if you script something linearly and then you try and remember it, you are giving yourself a hell of a lot of work that you don't really need. It takes actors ages and trained actors ages to memorize that script and make it sound authentic, right? Most of us don't have that time and we don't have that skill set. So what is the best thing to do for your brain? Because our brain is dynamic. It, our brain doesn't work linear. It works dynamically. Is go for mind maps. Go for key points around the page, but don't do them in a linear fashion. That allows you agility. You know, if you go off piece or someone asks a question and then you go all the way over here, you then think, all oh, right, no, let me go back to that bullet point. If it's linear and someone interjects, we can lose the whole lot. So really using structure that allows us flexibility and ability is key. Bubbles of a mind map are one of the simplest ways and if you think about how the bubbles on a mind map are, they are quite similar in a very simple way to the dynamic of the brain, to how the, the electrical pulses move around the brain. A mind map is a physical version of that. A script isn't. So that would be my tip on structure. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic point that you bring up, uh, Danny, which is uh, around the, the mind map. So, you know, I'll share from my uh, experience so typically what I tend to do is uh, before a presentation or whatever mm. I do write a script you know uh, but that script gives me clarity mm. in the way I want to say things but not necessarily read the script so which means I write that these are the points I want to cover there is mind map bits and there is also you know some of those two or three sentences yeah but um, you know when it actually comes to you know delivery time I just remember the mind maps and then a couple of points, but not the sentence, the way it was written down, you know. Right, exactly. And that's, and that's the key thing is you don't want to be getting it like word perfect. Correct. Um, but sure, yeah, I mean, pre prepare, definitely prepare and definitely whatever you need to prepare with. Um, but just don't give yourself that thing of pinning yourself to being word perfect or scripting. Yeah, definitely. Um, any other questions anyone would like to ask about speaking? or how I do speaking or how I get speaking gigs or anything like that. Is, it, is that useful? Yeah, hi Danny. Um, I would like to try and use your pausing strategy here. How do we get a TED Talk gig? <laughs> um, I would say I got mine by pure I got mine by pure connection, actually. There was, there was a talk happening and someone was working with someone I also worked with and they were looking for a particular subject matter to be addressed. And I happened to be someone who was really looking into that at the time, which was obviously around creativity and creative process and how we're not really valuing that. Um, but you can get a TEDx fairly easily, actually. Um, and I would say that's the good place to start before you look at doing a, a big TED talk. Sometimes TED will scoop up a good TEDx anyway and put it on their site. They're doing that more and more. But you literally go to the TED website, the, TED, the TEDx, sorry, TEDx website, and just search the areas in the data that have got TEDx conferences on. Get in touch with them. Tell them what you want to talk about. They may say yes, they may say no, but you can start just having those conversations with people. And what's really great about that is when someone says, oh, I'm really keen to have you, is it puts a boot up your backside <laughs> to do the work and get the thing ready. You know, that's, that's what I would say to do. And then once you've done a TEDx, you can either then approach to do a TED or like I said, TED might pick it up anyway if they feel like it's good enough. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The thing, the last thing I want to say is, just be the person who talks about their thing online. Be the person who writes the articles. Be the person who does the posts. And if you make sure that your message is really clear through all of those things, then people will start to get to know you as the expert on that anyway. And you're more likely to get invited to speak. 
that's how it was for me. That's how it is for me. People see what I'm about and then they hear about it through word of mouth or they say, oh, Danny did this great talk or, you know, sometimes that's one great talk, but, you know, there's enough of it going around that people will come back to me and they'll say, oh, can you come and talk at this or can we book you, etc." So it's really just knowing what's your message, what's your position on it and getting visible with that. And I think, I think uh, you know, um, uh, there's one point that you had raised uh, uh, in the initial stages of this uh, uh, this webinar, which is your, your passion, you know. And I think uh, uh, one of the key things for being a good speaker is you need to be passionate about the subject that you're talking on, you know. Absolutely, because, 100%, yeah. Yeah. Because I've tried, I've tried a couple of times on subjects which are extremely dry, and uh, when I say dry, you know, it could be you know passionate for somebody else, but you know, yeah, it's not your thing, though. Yeah, it, yeah. You, you know, it, it, there comes a point in time uh, during your speech, your juices dry out, and you start fumbling, and and that's not a good place to be, you know. No. So no, I I fully agree, fully agree. Have to care about it enough to stand up there and talk about it. Yeah, endlessly, almost. Yeah, you should be prepared to speak endlessly on that topic. Yeah, totally, totally. And of course, you can if you're passionate about something. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Um, any any other points or questions before we wrap? Please feel free also to get in touch with me afterwards. I think you will have my my details if you need them. I was going to stick a slide up here, but then I remembered you're going to put this online, and I don't want lots of people pestering me. <laughs> <laughs> but the guys all know where you guys all know where to find me so if there's anything that you want or i can support with at any point around speaking please reach me i'm really happy to help thank you very much danny uh, it's great a webinar i think it will be very very useful for many people who are going to watch it and it's definitely been useful for me and i'm sure for people on the call and uh, it's a great start to our series of webinars stay tuned for more <laughs> That's all I can say. And thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure. Good luck, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye.